Hey everyone, so today I'm doing a video on power scaling. Yes, power scaling because recently a lot of readers have been thrown off by recent events with the scabbards able to cut the seemingly invulnerable Kaido. And I think it's important to just take a step back and actually look at everything we know so far and make sense of it. Because too many people are jumping to really reactionary conclusions. And this goes beyond whether or not you personally care about power scaling. This is a matter of internal story consistency, right? Whether or not you cared about power scaling before chapter 987, I guarantee that if you took a poll of all readers before that chapter came out and asked everyone, do you think that Kiku can cut Kaido? You would probably have 99% of readers saying no. And that makes sense. So has spent a lot of time belaboring the point that Kaido is nearly impossible to damage. And it's actually been made a b big plot point that him being so hard to damage is a significant obstacle that must be overcome. So I understand why a lot of readers are freaking out to see so many characters, many of whom were never portrayed to be exceptionally strong, to suddenly be able to do something that was implied to be an extremely special and difficult feat. And look, I 100% agree that power scaling can get really toxic and distract from more important things, but this is a situation where I see half of readers trying to make sense of what seems like an inconsistency, and then the other half that's basically completely dismissing what just happened and saying, who cares, power scaling only gets in the way of the narrative, just enjoy the moment. I think that mentality is also problematic at times, to be honest, because it's basically saying, ignore the previously established framework of what should and shouldn't be possible. If that's the case, then why should we care about anything Oda tells us? Why should we feel any stakes at all about taking on a Yonko? So in this case, I am going to address the power scaling because I really, really like this moment, and I think it's important that it makes sense based on what Oda's established before. Now, a lot of readers are just jumping to the conclusion that, you know what, all the scabbards are probably just really strong. Right? Akainu implied that the samurai might be stronger than we think. We've probably been underestimating them this entire time. This one moment proves they're all crazy good swordsmen. To me, that's jumping to a really drastic conclusion based off one recent event and ignoring like hundreds of chapters of prior events. Like, yeah, if we pretend that all the scabbards must have been really strong all along, that will technically clear up this moment but really that would also create way more inconsistencies and plot points that don't make sense and confusing portrayals for the scabbards by Oda across hundreds of chapters. So no, Kinemon has not just secretly been a god-tier swordsman this entire time. Some of the scabbards are really strong, and some aren't, and Oda's already been pretty deliberate about showing us who is and isn't a big deal, but I'll get that I'll get to that in a little bit. So to start with I'll just say, let's stop referencing this quote by Akainu because it in no way means every scabbard is some sort of monster that the marines should fear. We already know the history behind this quote, right? We were told the history. The threat of Wano's samurai started being known throughout the world specifically because of Ryuma. And then it was likely reinforced in modern times thanks to Odin, who was one of the strongest characters in the world during his time as a pirate. And yes, even in modern day Wano, there are clearly still some extremely strong samurai. Wano has some world-class fighters that should be respected, but it's nothing ridiculous. Not every scabbard is like Ashura or like Denjiro. I'll talk more about this again later in the video, but I'm just going to start with the straightforward reasons for why it makes sense that the scabbards injured Kaido without that necessarily meaning that they're all a bunch of vistas, for example. To me, there are two reasons that make sense that fit with what we've already been shown. First, that Kaido and Big Mom both seem to be extremely invulnerable creatures, and in Big Mom's case, it was implied that this was largely related to her hockey, since as we saw with the Mother Carmel incident, her invulnerability fluctuates based on her general emotional state. With Kaido, we clearly saw that the sight of Odin's scabbards triggered some sort of PTSD for him, with his old wound even acting up. So the first potential explanation we have is that you know, Kaido was just in a more vulnerable state than normal, which is why it was possible for him to be cut. I personally like this idea, but I think the other option that the scabbards were simply able to damage Kaido because they know advanced armament hockey or Ryo is more likely. And that's because at this thought bubble, where Kaido seems to imply that it's not his own, you know, vulnerability that's letting him be cut, 
But the fact that the samurai are using Ryo like Odin, or basically what we as the readers refer to as advanced armament hockey. So while the Mother Carmel explanation is interesting and seems to make sense here, I think the implication we have been given so far that is more straightforward is that the scabbards are actually able to cut Kaido thanks to their hockey mastery. We will see in the next couple chapters which is the case for sure, but at the moment at least I'll assume it's just that they know advanced armament hockey. Now, here's the big point. It's been established that advanced armament seems to be the key to being able to damage Kaido. However, what people forget is that you do not need to be a strong character to be able to use advanced hockey techniques. I actually already had an entire video on hockey where I covered this, but the fact is that weak characters can still have mastered advanced techniques. Yes, there's probably a correlation where strong characters are more likely to know advanced techniques, but weak characters can still have advanced hockey. Like, Marigold is one of the first characters in the entire series to show this second level of armament hockey, and she lost to pre-time skip Luffy. Hyogro is currently frail and weak, but he can still use advanced techniques. Now that we know from Vivre cards that Luchi knew armament hockey pre-time skip, it's pretty clear that the Rokugan was actually an advanced armament hockey technique, based on the fact that it works pretty much exactly how this technique is described an invisible force coming out of the fist and damaging the opponent from the inside. Considering Hyogoro made it sound like this advanced form of hockey is commonplace in Wano, like to them it's what standard Ryo is, yes, it makes sense that the scabbards all know it. At the same time, that doesn't mean we need to reevaluate how strong they all are, this just establishes that they know a particular technique that is one of the few things that is actually effective against Kaido. It's the same way that, you know, Kinemon knows a technique to cut fire and Zoro doesn't, but that doesn't mean Kinemon is stronger than Zoro, it just means he knows a rare technique. Also, by the way, I'm starting to think that cutting fire may just be Ryo, but that's not worth discussing here. So, bottom line is, Scabbards being able to cut Kaido isn't necessarily inconsistent with what we were told before. We were told that advanced armament may be the secret to damaging Kaido, and that advanced armament is commonly learned in Wano as Ryo. They all know this technique, that's all this is, at least that's what it seems. The individual scabbards are probably still about as strong as you thought they were before they attacked Kaido. Okay, so now that leads to the next question which is, you know, how strong are the individual scabbards? What should we expect now that they're all ganging up on Kaido? And here's the second subject I want to address which is that the scabbards are not, you know, a monolith. I see people saying scabbard level sometimes which makes no sense to me. Like, you wouldn't say straw hat level, because the straw hats are a wide range of fighters, right? The same applies to the scabbards, except doubly so, because some of them have an additional 20 years of experience under their belt. From everything we've seen, some of the scabbards are really strong, whereas others have not really had their combat abilities talked up much. But, because we have so many of them, and you know, they've been popping in and out of the story for a few hundred chapters, I think it's easy to kind of forget how a lot of them have been portrayed. So here I'm going to do, I'm going to just make it real simple and do a quick retrospective of them as a group. As I see it, you can divvy up the scabbards into two groups in terms of strength, with one group being the really exceptionally strong fighters that Oda took great care to hype up as swordsmen, and then the other group who are obviously, you know, decently strong, but definitely not comparable to the first group. So, let's start with the first group. Of the four scabbards who have been portrayed as really strong fighters. First is Ashura Doji. Ashura has always been the scabbard with the most hype around him. He actually ruled the lawless region of Kuri and was known as its strongest monster. In fact, he was an infamous monster known across all of Wano. He is still known as a powerful fighter in Wano today, even by Kaido. And most importantly, he actually gave Odin himself some trouble. So it was made pretty clear that at least when the nine scabbards initially formed, Ashura was the strongest scabbard. Even looking at, you know, the Ashra Jack fight against a Calamity, Ashra did pretty well. He got a hit in, Jack got a hit back, so going roughly even with the Calamity, one of Ayonko's top fighters already puts Ashra in pretty elite territory in terms of one in terms of the general One Piece world, right? I think it's pretty clear that Ashra has a lot more under his belt than the average scabbard, and that Oda has gone out of his way to portray him as really strong right from the get-go. Now, if we take Ashra out of the picture, as he was pretty explicitly portrayed as a monster from the start, there are then three other exceptionally strong scabbards, right? 
These three were all initially children in the Odin flashback, who then grew up to be a lot stronger, especially over the 20 year time skip, and that's Denjiro, Inurashi, and Nekomamushi. Denjiro we know today is actually pretty ridiculously strong, we saw that pretty blatantly with his encounter with Zoro. Zoro has himself been frequently hyped up as a very strong fighter even by New World standards, yet Denjiro was holding off an enraged Zoro without breaking a sweat. Now, I'm not trying to stir up controversy, I'm not saying Zoro couldn't have beaten him, because I don't know, maybe he could if he went all out, maybe he couldn't at the time, but he can now, but the point is that at face value, Zoro was at least trying seriously and Denjiro wasn't having any trouble. Not to mention, in Denjiro's official reveal, he did the same thing as Mihawk in his introduction, and Zoro in his post time skip introduction, which was cutting a huge ship in half. Not a crazy feat in itself, but it's more so the meaning that comes with it in this series, as it's historically been a way that strong swordsmen have introduced themselves in the past. And on top of that, even if we look back at Wano 20 years ago, there are some soft implications that Denjiro had already grown up to become an extraordinarily strong scabbard alongside Ashura Doji already. Interestingly, Ashura and Denjiro both seem to act independently of the rest of the scabbards with their own unique responsibilities, and more importantly, these two alone were the only ones who stayed back and actually managed to hold off Kaido momentarily by themselves before he got to the castle, with Kaido remembering them both in particular. So Denjiro already hinted at as potentially being strong by the time of Odin's death, and at this point very explicitly being portrayed as an exceptionally strong swordsman. Lastly we have Inurashi and Nekomamushi who I think are shockingly underrated by readers, like people seem to have just straight up forgotten how they were portrayed in so. They clearly benefited the most from the extra 20 years to become strong, which makes sense as they were still young at the time of Odin's death, and they weren't locked up like Kawamatsu. It was made explicitly clear that they have become as strong as Ashura Doji, like Oda went out of his way to show that Inurashi and Ashura are equal to each other, and at the time it was actually used up to hype up Ashura that he was able to go toe to toe with the duke. On top of that, Inurashi, Nekomamushi, and Ashura all had pretty much identical interactions with Jack, so they each started by getting the better of him, Inu stopped him, Neko threw him, Ashura cut him, each of them surprised him with their strength. After that we know that Inu and Neko fought evenly with Jack for a while and that Ashura was at least fighting evenly with him for a bit. So they all did pretty much exactly the same against the same opponent and they were explicitly shown to be equal to each other. So Oda could not have been any more clear in showing us that these three are the same. Lastly is just their portrayal. It's easy to forget how much Oda was hyping the two dukes up during Zo, but I suggest you go back and reread. The dukes were portrayed as absolute monsters, much like Ashura Doji in the past. Like we had Capone Beige, a member of the worst generation, who was completely confident in being able to handle the Strahd crew on Zo clearly shaken and sweating just from the presence of Nekomamushi behind him, and he immediately ran away upon his arrival. Again, not all the scabbards are portrayed like this. Some of them, like the Dukes, have clearly been built up to be a lot more formidable than the others. The Dukes have been all smiles and goofiness in recent times, so it's easy to, to forget that these guys were really hyped up at one point in time. So basically, Ashura, Denjiro, the Dukes, these guys are the scabbards that Oda has heavily built up. There's a huge gap in portrayal between these four and then the rest. So now let's quickly talk about the rest. Starting with Kinemon. Because Kinemon has had the weirdest shift in perception in terms of his strength ever since Wano started. Like literally based on nothing, people have started to be like, you know what, Kinemon is probably one of the stronger scabbards. No. No, let's get this out of the way. This misconception is purely based on the fact that we found out that Kinemon is the acting leader of the Scabbards. And yes, often leaders are the strongest members of the group, but Kinemon is act not actually the, lead the real leader of the Scabbards, that was Odin. Kinemon was just Odin's first follower, that had nothing to do with his strength. And today he's not like the boss of the Scabbards, he's more so been the guy who's been trying to get the band back together. And he's done a great job, and I actually have grown to really like and respect Kinemon as a character. He's actually my favorite scabbard at this point, which I never thought I'd say. But it's not because he's strong. Because he's not. Because that's not his character. Oda has literally never tried to imply that Kinemon is a particularly strong fighter, and we have 300 chapters preceding Wano to prove it. 
It's actually insane to me that people somehow forget everything Oda has shown us about Kinemon's utter averageness before and just misinterpreted his status as acting head of the scabbards to mean that this proves he's a strong fighter. So now, as a quick refresher to everyone, and to completely end any notion of Kinemon being an amazing fighter, I present to you a complete rundown of the long and remarkably unimpressive history of Kinemon in combat situations. So, to start with, we are introduced to him after he has already been off-screened by Law. So he starts off having taken a loss that we haven't even seen. After that, he struggles with Brook. Yes, it's just his torso, but it's also implied that Kinemon is aware of his surroundings, even while his body was separated, as he was able to hold conversations with Luffy through his farts. He knew his torso was fighting someone, he was able to dodge attacks, etc. Could Kinemon have done better with his full body? Yeah, probably, but it's not like Brook thought he was going up against some beast of a swordsman during their fight. Brook was more so creeped out than anything. Kinemon said he can't beat Brook and Brook left because Kinemon was scary, not because he was outmatched. Later on, he and Brook beat a dragon together, which is Kinemon's one win in the story. But again, not really shown to be much better than Brook. Then we have an angry Kinemon attempting to fight Zoro, who is completely unfazed and is not even taking him seriously. You could call this a gag moment, but it's not like this is a squabble between friends. Here, Kinemon legitimately thinks Zoro stole Wano's national treasure and is pretty clearly serious about wanting a real duel. You even have Nami saying that it's dangerous to attack like that on the ship, so overall it looks like Kinemon is attacking pretty seriously, but he's just way too much of a non-threat for Zoro to even take seriously. Then we get to Dressrosa and Kinemon is pretty easily dealt with by Doflamingo. Then probably most embarrassingly, Kinemon gets taken down by a mob of Dressrosa citizens. It's actually a pretty crucial moment where Kinemon needed to help buy time for Usopp to save Luffy's life, and literally just a large group of citizens climbing the plateau capture him. We've seen swordsmen, by the way, beat citizens without killing them, so that's not really an excuse here. And lastly, it was made pretty clear that he had no chance against Pika and was freaking out when Pika was approaching. It was implied that everyone on the plateau was pretty much dead if Zoro didn't save them. Not to mention that Kinemon was in complete awe of Zoro cutting Pika, so that should at least tell you that there is a huge gap between Kinemon and Zoro, as was implied before. Now yes, you can go back through and really nitpick and come up with little excuses for a lot of these points that I brought up. Like yeah, maybe Law surprise attacked Kinemon, maybe Kinemon would have beaten Brook if he had his full body or something. Maybe Kinemon would have put up more of a fight against Doflamingo if he didn't get distracted. You can go on and try and, you know, make some sort of an argument to try and excuse everything individually, but the point is that cumulatively, it's about 300 chapters of Kinemon not exactly being a great fighter and Oda never implying that he is a great fighter. And I'm not cherry picking here, that was literally every combat scenario Kinemon's been in before Wano. Though if you want to count Wano, then let's throw in him losing to this boar. I think ultimately if you had to place Kinemon, saying he's about as strong as Brook, maybe somewhat stronger, isn't crazy. And that's fine. That's respectable. Brook's no slouch, but I don't see Kinemon going toe-to-toe -to -toe with calamities like these guys. Again, what I'm highlighting here is that there's a big gap between the four strongest scabbards and then the rest. Because after Kinemon, who else do we have? Kiku, who is Kinemon's apprentice, so I think we can safely put her below him. Not to mention she is one of the youngest scabbards and she did not benefit from the 20 years extra training that the Dukes got. Then we've got Kawamatsu, who also missed out on the 20 years of improvement as he was imprisoned for most of the time. Kawamatsu's biggest feat, by the way, is, you know, flipping some fodder. Later on, he attempted to surprise attack Zoro from behind and was easily blocked. So again, feels like a big gap between how someone like Kawamatsu is portrayed compared to someone like Denjiro. Not to mention, it seems like Kawamatsu got captured by a bunch of randoms. So Oda's not really portraying Kiku and Kawamatsu like someone like Ashura in any sense. Then we have Raizo, who has pretty much nothing going for him. I don't know what else to say. Raizo has literally nothing going for him. I think it's obvious he's not one of the stronger scabbards. So I think the two groups are pretty clear. We have Ashura, Denjiro, Inu, and Neko, who have impressive feats and a lot of individual hype behind them. Oda has clearly spent time establishing their portrayal as extremely strong fighters. Then we have the rest of the scabbards, who are obviously, you know, they're solid fighters, but they're not comparable to the previous four. And lastly, we have Izzo. Izzo's the tricky one since he only just showed up, 
but I would be inclined to guess that Izzo is more like the bottom four than the top four. I don't think Izzo shooting the sword out of King's hand is a big deal, since it was immediately followed by Nekomamushi knocking the club out of Kaido's hand right afterwards, so it's clear that a weaker character can disarm a much stronger character if it's a surprise attack. Izzo could be a lot weaker than King and still have disarmed him. This moment doesn't really mean much on its own. As such, I'm going to go with the safer assumption, which is sticking to my impression of Izzo from the Marine Ford War. So, to start with, a lot of people have been saying that the fact that Izzo was a Whitebeard commander means that Izzo is probably really strong. That doesn't really make any sense. That argument would make sense if all Whitebeard commanders were really strong, but that's not the case. We had 16 commanders, but only 3 were portrayed as exceptional. 4 if you count Ace. Then the rest were decent, but unremarkable. You know, you had guys like Curio being matched up against Moria, Atmos being fodderized by Doflamingo, literally 5 commanders coming together to attack Kizaru at once and Kizaru not being phased in the slightest. So basically just being a Whitebeard commander doesn't really prove much on its own. I'm not saying they're fodder, I'm sure a lot of them are fairly strong and could take on some vice admirals or something like that, but I'm saying in the grand scheme of things, being a Whitebeard commander on its own doesn't mean much. Like Oda pretty clearly highlighted that Marco, Jozu, and Vista were the truly exceptional ones, and they were obviously the only ones who were shown temporarily holding off the Marines' strongest fighters on their own. That's of course in line with the general pattern we've seen that the Yonko all tend to have three elite fighters who are a cut above the rest. I don't think Izzo was ever implied to be close to these guys during the war, or better than any of the other commanders, so I'm not going to assume he's exceptionally strong until shown otherwise. You know, you could say maybe Oda just didn't have time to highlight Izzo, but that doesn't really make any sense either, because if you go back, Marine Ford has about a million standalone panels of just random characters skirmishing, and Oda could easily have used one panel among those to show Izzo taking on someone decently strong, and he just didn't. The simpler explanation is, is that Oda knows what he's doing, and he just made a deliberate point of highlighting the three Whitebeard commanders that were actually strong enough to reasonably take on a top tier opponent. All that being said, is it possible that Izzo is actually really strong, maybe as strong as these four? I guess maybe, we've seen so little of him, it's possible, I'm just personally going with the safer assumption for the moment that Izzo is probably better off grouped with these other four. That, that's not to say that these guys are weak, just that some scabbards have been portrayed as exceptionally strong, and the others haven't. So all that is to say, that in light of the recent chapter seemingly throwing everything off in terms of what we can expect from the scabbards, I think if we just you know, take a step back and look at everything we know, Oda has actually given us a pretty good idea of how strong the scabbards are as a whole, and that we shouldn't be so reactionary to moments like this. When we see characters doing things that seem beyond their previously established capabilities, I think it's better to first look back and see if there's a reason that makes sense, rather than completely rewriting history of how strong that character has been portrayed to be. If you enjoyed this video, then definitely like, share, and subscribe, and you can support me on Patreon to get my extended thoughts podcast on this and all future topics.